The flu sucks. Every year, it affects millions of people and kills several thousand of them. I'm talking about actual influenza. High fever, cold sweats, constant body aches. These B-roll actors probably don't have the flu. You can tell because they're wearing makeup, and if you have the flu, you are too busy praying for a quick death to put on mascara. I'm so sorry. Anyway, the flu is a right beast, and we can't beat it because it evolves too quickly for us to develop a lasting vaccine. But thanks to some snot from cancer patients fighting the flu, we finally got a sneak peek at how evolution works. And what we learned could change how we view the entire universe. Or maybe just help us make a better flu vaccine. This is On the Fringe, a show about weird ideas that just might change the world. Viruses like influenza have a very uh, short generation time. For humans, a generation that tends to be, you know, 25, 30 years. For a virus like influenza, it's less than 12 hours. This is Jesse Bloom, an evolutionary biologist at the Fred Hutch Cancer Center in Seattle. He's super cool and super smart and everything, but we're actually here to see one of his graduate students. My name is Catherine Shu. I'm a graduate student at the University of Washington, and I study how viruses evolve. I've been really interested in viruses because they're some of the fastest evolving things on Earth. We usually think about that change happening over really, really long spans of time, like thousands or millions of years. But I'm super interested in how living things can change in much shorter amounts of time, um, just maybe days or weeks or months. The reason the flu is so difficult to beat is the same reason it's great for studying evolution. It evolves super fast. So you make a vaccine to fight one strain of the flu virus, and before you know it, poof, it evolves and you need a new one. For a long time, I was kind of abstractly just curious about this question of how much viruses could possibly change within someone in the short time that they're sick. Um, but it seemed to me that this was something that would just be really, really hard to study. For one thing, most people who get the flu don't even go to the doctor, let alone have their mucus tested to see if it has the flu virus. And even then, it would only be a single data point. It didn't seem like it was possible to study how the flu evolved in one person over time until her advisor made a random discovery. I was uh, down in the coffee shop at the, at the Fred Hutch, and I was talking to Steve Pergam, who's in charge of infection control for immunocompromised cancer patients. I said, you know, what are you up to these days? And we started talking. And he said, you know, I'm having trouble getting samples about patients that have, you know, multiple samples and patients that have flu. And I, do you have any ideas about maybe where I could get that? Turns out Steve was sitting on a freezer full of frozen gold. If by gold, you mean mucus from cancer patients fighting the flu. While most flu infections might last a couple of days, the immunosuppressed patients at the Fred Hutch Cancer Center had flu infections that lasted for months and there were samples from across that entire timeline. Catherine had all the samples she needed. She began to sequence the RNA of the flu samples and immediately had a surprising result. Like really, really surprising. The first set of samples that Catherine sequenced showed that the flu evolved in ways that no one expected. So I saw these two mutations that were almost perfect matches with each other. They arose within a couple weeks, they made up about half of the viral population, and then they kind of went away. In that initial analysis, I realized that there was a lot of evolution going on. It was pretty complicated, and something interesting was happening. By using deep sequencing techniques, Catherine wasn't just seeing the average virus in the patient. She was seeing all the different strains and how prevalent each of them were. And because she had multiple samples over time, she could see how it changed over the course of the infection. She could literally see evolution. Then she sequenced the samples from the other three patients, and that's when things got really weird. When she finally sort of put this data together, and she looked at these different patients, and she saw the same mutations appearing in multiple different patients, and we saw the evolutionary process is in some ways repeating itself multiple times. That, to me, was kind of the eureka moment. Now, mutations are supposed to be completely random. So it's very surprising to see several patients each having the same mutations. 
These are four patients who are different from each other. They're not giving each other the flu. They have very, very complicated medical histories, very, very different infections. And yet, starting from different viral backgrounds, we see in many cases the exact same mutations occurring and then reaching high frequencies within these patients. Not only did these patients have some of the same flu mutations arising independently from one another, they also shared commonalities with how the flu evolved globally. The snot from these patients was a preview of how the flu would then evolve out in the world. Sort of like looking through a crystal ball, except it's made of boogers, and seeing a glimpse of the future. Someday soon, this means we can expect better forecasting for flu vaccines. But it also means we have a new perspective on evolution as a whole. It raises huge questions about how predictable or repeatable any evolutionary process is. But the most important takeaway is this. A 20-something graduate student in Seattle changed the way the world looks at evolution. And you are watching videos on the internet, which, which is great for us. Don't stop watching these videos, please, God.